Flora and Tamo as our today's seminar speaker today. Florian um, has done his PhD at the University of Natural Resources and, the, and uh, Life Science in Vienna, Austria. Um, he then joined Peter Belyuk's group at Mount Sinai School of Medicine um, as a postdoc, where he was already working on a, a designing and developing a universal influenza vaccine, um, which is right now in clinical trials. Yes. Yeah. So talking about applied science, really goes from them to uh, that side. So um, he now has his own lab since a couple of years um, where at, the, at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, Eisen School of Medicine. And he is interested in, uh, in looking at the adaptive immune response, antibody response against lichen shields of RNA viruses. So everything, a lot of the work he has been doing was in influenza, but really also like he has been like instrumental when the, in the beginning of the pandemic, his lab has shared like, you know, plasmids con um, coding for the spike protein with hundreds of laboratories around the world, like including Shane's, I think. So he really has yeah. been like from the very beginning an instrumental like in like, you know, uh, in studying and understanding the immune response against SARS-CoV-2. And that's what he's gonna talk to us today about, um, about antibody responses to SARS-CoV-2 in infection and vaccination. So thank you very much. I'm uh, looking forward to it. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so this is a very nondescript title. This I could talk about many things, um, but what I'll try to do is I'll give you uh, first a little bit of an intro what we did early in the pandemic in, in New York at Mount Sinai. Um, and then I'll go into a few aspects of immunity to SARS coronavirus 2 that I find specifically interesting. And I'll, I have included some uh, findings that are unpublished that, that you know, we are, we are really actively working on right now. Uh, just to start out, uh, my disclosures, Mount Sinai has filed IP on, on antibody tests for SARS-CoV-2 and also for vaccines that we have uh, in development right now, and I'm actually going to talk a little bit about that. Um, just to, as an introduction, I wanted to start from the beginning. Um, for a lot of us, this pandemic started earlier than actually when the pandemic was de declared by the WHO. A lot of us got, uh, got um, interested in this in, in, in the end of December of uh, 2019 when there was a report from, from the Chinese government to the WHO uh, basically saying that they had uh, pneumonia of unknown etiology um, in Wuhan. Um, and um, that's kind of where all of this um, most likely started. Probably started somewhere in the countryside and was then brought to Wuhan probably uh, via animals that were sol uh, sold at this, uh, at this um, uh, animal market. Um, but this is when all of this started. Uh, where are we now with SARS coronavirus 2? Uh, I think everybody assumes the pandemic is over. Uh, if you look at the current numbers, uh, you can see that uh, officially we had about 690 uh, million infections worldwide. That's a certainly an underestimate. A lot of them didn't get recorded. And officially we have about 6.9 million uh, deaths due to COVID-19 uh, globally. If you look at these epic curves, um, initially it looks like there were a few cases, uh, that's a complete underestimate because the, the uh, diagnostics were not up and running. Uh, but then you see this wave character and this huge wave here is actually Omicron, uh, the BA1 wave, followed by BA2 wave, uh, BA5 wave, and then waves uh, I think this here is specifically uh, infections in China when the virus made it into the country. Um, when we look at deaths, um, you see that initially there was already a very high death toll and we had a pretty big problem in New York in the beginning of the pandemic. And then you see the waves basically coming and going. And what you see here, this is again the Omicron BA1 peak um, and that's also reflected in deaths. So this virus was far from uh, attenuated, it was actually as, as lethal as the original or the alpha variant, just less lethal uh, as compared to the delta variant. Um, the good thing is that the number of deaths are not going down, but the virus is of course not going to disappear. Um, so this, uh, this numbers, uh, number of 6.9 million uh, COVID-19 deaths is, is of course an underestimate. If you look at, um, at excess mortality globally, uh, currently the idea is that we had about 22 million deaths due to COVID-19, um, which is, you know, in the ballpark of what we are assuming for the 1918 pandemic of influenza uh, with H1N1, but of course the population was much smaller back then. And so this is not as severe, but it's likely the most severe uh, respiratory uh, virus pandemic since 1918. 
And so, as I said, I got interested in this early, um, in, in, in late 2019, uh, when there was an article about these uh, this, uh, pneumonia cases, and I thought, uh, okay, that's flu, right? My laboratory works on influenza. Uh, there's a lot of zoonotic infections with different influenza virus subtypes in Southeast Asia. And so you pay attention to that. And often, you know, when these viruses are sequenced and isolated, we start to make reagents. We start to look at vaccines and immune responses. And so I, I, I paid attention to that. But 10 days later, it became clear uh, that this is a coronavirus and not an influenza virus. Um, my lab wasn't a coronavirus lab. Um, of course, I was involved in some coronavirus projects and I knew a little bit about the virus. Um, and when we looked at the sequence, um, you know, it was basically clear that if you want to look at protective immune responses, the first and foremost target for that would be the spike protein, right? Um, most uh, coronaviruses only have one surface Geico protein and that's the spike. Some have a second one, but this only had one and so that was the most important target for neutralizing antibodies hypothetically, right? Uh, you need to show all these things, but the idea was that if you have an antibody that binds uh, to the spike protein, specifically to the receptor binding domain, that would block interaction of the spike and the receptor binding domain with our cellular receptors, um, and that would uh, basically protect you from infection. And so we do a lot of these studies for influenza, um, and we thought, okay, uh, maybe this virus will come to the US as well. And so we started to prepare uh, reagents and assays that we could use just in case we, we would get infections. We actually started to bank serum samples in January as well. Uh, and we started to bank uh, specimens of, from respiratory infections that were RSV negative and influenza negative. And we actually found later on that the first uh, cases in New York probably already occurred in January and not in late February. Um, and so we worked on that. It was actually uh, relatively hard to set up assays initially because we didn't have uh, samples from infected individuals. The CDC didn't share. Um, and we ended up getting some samples from Australia and Finland. And that allowed us to set up a very simple ELISA assay to look at zero conversion. It's actually boring. It's, it's not rocket science at all. But we basically set up an assay where we could screen for people who were already zero positive for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and that became important in the end of February uh, when we started to see a lot of cases in New York. And of course, there were no treatment options. Um, and one idea was, okay, if we have somebody who, have, who has already antibodies, then we can take that plasma and we can use it to treat uh, people with severe infections, right? Um, that didn't work out that well in the end, but it was one of the options that we had in the beginning. And so we transferred an ELISA assay from my research laboratory to our clinical um, laboratory, which is a BIA lab. Um, and that assay um, basically was a two-step ELISA to, to, to look for, for people who were truly positive and had high titers. Um, and um, it was the first time I did something like that, but we got that approved by the New York State regulatory authorities uh, still, I believe, in March of, of uh, 2020 and the FDA approved it as lab developed uh, test in April of 2020 in a very unconventional way. I'm not going to talk about it. Um, and of course, we also wanted to, to share these reagents because this was a pandemic and uh, you have to share these things and help others to set this up. And so we wrote a protocol, we published that at some point uh, open access, but I just put it on my, on my homepage. Everybody could download it and that was basically for reagent generation and for setting up the ELISAs. And we also shared these uh, reagents with more than 250 labs. Initially, we just shipped these things out, uh, which got me into big trouble with our tech transfer office. Um, but I have to say, I would do it again. I wouldn't ask them for permission next time either. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, uh, of course, uh, we had this set up. And um, then interesting questions appeared when the, when the pandemic started to develop, right? Um, you might remember these newspaper articles. Initially, um, a lot of people in Asia reported that there were reinfections that happened very, fre uh, very frequently, right? It later turned out that in this case, it wasn't reinfections, it was persistent RNA that was detected. Um, and there was one paper uh, by a Chinese group that reported that antibodies would go away within eight weeks. And if you work on antibodies, you know that that's not a thing, right? They don't disappear within, within uh, eight weeks. 
And so uh, we sat down and we, in this case, is uh, a collaborator of mine at Sine, uh, Viviana Simon and myself, and we wanted to set up a study to ask three questions. Uh, the first one was, how long do antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 last after natural infection? The next one was, how well are convalescent individuals protected from reinfection? And the last one was, can we define a correlate of protection and can we figure out how high your, your antibody titer needs to be in order to <coughs> protect you? Uh, we failed completely with the third one, but other, more, uh, other smarter people solved that actually. But I think we, we had some answers for the first two. And so in order to do that, uh, we set up a study that we called BERIS, or uh, Protection Associated with Rapid Immunity to SARS-CoV-2. And that was in April of uh, 2020. <coughs> At that point, we already had a lot of people in uh, New York who had been infected and had uh, recovered, including in our healthcare worker population. And so we set this up as a healthcare worker cohort with the aim to enroll approximately 500 people half of them naive at the, uh, at the point of enrollment, and the other half uh, already with antibodies present or with, with previous infections. And the idea was to just follow them, look at antibody kinetics. Um, initially, we were pretty ambitious about that. We bled them every two weeks. Now the interval is a little bit longer. Um, and we wanted to study the risk of reinfection. And we also collected uh, saliva samples from them because we wanted to look at mucosal immunity too. And so we got funding for, for that from NIH relatively quickly. And they also said that the study is too small, we should expand it. And so we teamed up with different uh, investigators that are in the civics network um, and started to set up a larger cohort, specifically the one in Michigan, uh, which was run by or is run by Aubrey Gordon, has about 3,000 people in the cohort. Um, I'm not going to talk about, uh, about these other studies. I'm just focusing on, on the data that we have. Um, and so the easiest question to answer was, how do we look in terms of antibody kinetics? Um, and this is basically showing what we found uh, initially in the cohort. Uh, we have here on the y-axis um, antibody titers, just ELISA against the spike protein, and here uh, time since enrollment. So this is not infection, this is enrollment. Um, and a lot of people, uh, when they enrolled in the study, were already uh, two months, approximately two months past their, uh, their initial infection. So you see some antibody titers coming down here, but there's not really a strong waning effect. You actually, they, they stay relatively relatively uh, stable. Of course, we are lacking data points out here to the right, but that is because these were healthcare workers and they were of course getting vaccinated. And I'll show you that data in a bit. Um, and we found that approximately 5% of people who initially had antibodies uh, zero reverted, which is you know not a bad rate at all. You see that for free as well. So everything looked relatively normal. And then in that cohort, we also monitored for infections. And as I said, we had uh, naive individuals, which are symbolized by these blue, uh, uh, symbol or which are these blue symbols here. And then we had people already had uh, antibodies that study enrollment. Um, and these are shown in orange. And then you have the mixed ones, uh, which are basically uh, people who zero reverted. And when we looked at infections, and this was in the first year, there were no variants around yet. Um, you can clearly see that um, there's a huge effect, right? Um, 10 out of the 11 infections were in the naive individuals. One was in a zero reverter after that person lost uh, detectable antibodies. Um, and that basically, in, in our case, showed that infection protects you from reinfection relatively well. And of course, we're not the only, uh, we were not the only group doing things like that. There are uh, a lot of studies out there, including two very large uh, uh, studies from the UK that show that uh, this protection from reinfection is very solid and initially was in the ballpark of, uh, of what the vaccines did when they were rolled out. So 90 plus percent protection. Uh, this also held true when Delta uh, came around. Um, it changed with Omicron. And we, we think that the reason for that is that neutralizing antibodies wouldn't neutralize Omicron anymore and that led to reinfections. But with Omicron, this was really the first time when you saw a really large proportion of reinfections. Um, but still, even nowadays, you can measure protection. It's, it's low, but it's statistically significant. There's a few studies that, that show protection from reinfection with Omicron that are around 25% uh, uh, in terms of protective efficacy. Um, 
and so since this was a healthcare worker cohort, all of these people got vaccinated uh, in the end of 2020 and the beginning of, of 2022. And that gave us the uh, 2021. And that gave us the chance to look at how immune responses uh, would develop in naive individuals when they got vaccinated and how immune responses would develop in people who already had an infection previously and then got vaccinated. Um, before I go into that, I just wanted to contrast infection-induced immunity and vaccine-induced immunity because there are differences. It's not like one is better than the other, but there are certainly uh, big differences. Um, so for infection-induced immunity, we know that um, the immune, res immune system targets the structural proteins, and there are several of them, right? And it targets non-structural proteins. And there's actually a lot of open reading frames that are expressed in our cells when we get infected. Um, in addition to that, uh, viruses appear as quasi-species, right? You probably, when you get an infection, you probably get some uh, diversity within the same host. And so the immune system might actually see a little bit more diversity. Um, and then potentially in an infection, the antigen can be present longer. There was a study from, from Rockefeller, for example, where they found the antigen even six months after infection in the gut. Um, and in addition to that, when you get infected, you get systemic immune responses, but also mucosal immune responses because that's the infection site, right? The downside here is that it's variable. Some people respond very well, and for others, uh, the response is very poor. And that is in contrast to vaccination, where we see at least in, um, in healthy adults, the response is relatively homogeneous and it's strong. Um, the other difference here is that um, you know, it's just the immune responses to the vaccination are just focused on the spike, at least in, in the US. Uh, in other parts of the world, world, that's different, but our vaccines only have the spike in it. Uh, it's a consensus spike, at least it was before the, the bivalent vaccines were rolled out. And you get mostly systemic immunity because injected vaccines are really not, not good at inducing mucosal immune responses. So those are the differences you have to keep in mind. All right, and so this is a graph that shows you what happened after vaccination. Uh, again, on the y-axis, we have antibody data against the spike. Uh, on the x-axis, we have uh, time after vaccination. So first shot here, second shot here. And then we have two groups. In orange, we have people who had uh, pre-existing immunity through infection. When they get their first shot of vaccine, uh, their antibody titers shoot up. Uh, the second shot doesn't actually do uh, much in our, in, in our study. Um, and then you get this waning phase and it seems like there's a stabilization phase afterward. Um, in naive individuals, initially this looks a little bit different, right? So you get your first shot, antibody titers go up. You get your second shot, uh, they go up further, they are boosted. But then you also get the same waning phase and the same stabilization phase with the difference that the, the, GMD uh, the GMDs or the, the, the mean titers of the blue group are always lower than uh, of the orange group. Um, so initially, people were very worried about this waning part here, right? Um, we see here a drop of about 10 to 15 fold between the peak titers and then the stabilization phase here. Um, but and a lot of you are probably more knowledgeable when it comes to, to, uh, to cellular responses in terms of T cells than I do. But basically, this is what you would expect. This is a response that's driven by plasmoblasts, uh, which pump out a lot of antibody, uh, but are transient and actually um, disappear after about two weeks. Uh, the antibody sticks around because it has a longer half-life, right? It has a half-life of about 21 days for IgG1. Um, and then you get this decline over time. And this stabilization phase is probably driven by uh, long-lived plasma cells in the bone marrow that can get very old and some of them can stick around lifelong. Uh, so that wasn't actually a very big surprise, but I think the public saw that as, as, as surprising. Uh, the other point was, you know, you have this variable response through, uh, that is induced by infection with some people being low, some people being high. And when you got vaccinated, um, everybody got boosted up. So people profit uh, from, from getting vaccinated um, from, that, uh, from that type of hybrid immunity. Um, the other observation that we had was, of course, we kept monitoring infections. Um, and the interesting part here was uh, during that phase, and this again was before Omicron arrived in New York, uh, we had 14 breakthrough infections, um, most of them with Delta. Uh, 
and they were exclusively in the blue group. We didn't have a single breakthrough infection in the orange group. Um, and this might have to do with this difference in quantity, but it might also have to do with a different quality of the immune response. Um, and what is also important here is that after Omicron hit, we started to see breakthroughs in the orange group as well, but the trend still is holding. So the hybrid immune have a better protection even from, from infection even now as compared to people who have, uh, have been vaccinated only. Um, the other important point was um, that typically when you get, as I said, a uh, natural infection with a respiratory virus, you develop a systemic immune response. You get a lot of IgG in, in serum. That IgG actually can protect the lung. That's important because that protects you from severe disease. But you also get uh, secretory IgA responses in the upper respiratory tract. And that is in contrast to injected vaccines, which typically drive a very strong systemic immune response, but very often not, uh, an, uh, not a robust um, uh, immune response in the upper respiratory tract. You can actually get some of the IgG when it's very high that uh, ends up in the upper respiratory tract, but typically you lack this specific secretory IgA response. And one idea, and we'll get back to that in the end, is uh, that you could actually induce that, uh, mimic uh, the natural infection by intranasal vaccination and still get this protection in the upper respiratory tract. And as I said, the systemic immunity is important to protect you from severe disease, but if you want to get protection from infection, you likely need to have uh, protection in the upper respiratory tract. And so we had saliva samples. And uh, we were able to look in, into that also in these two different groups, right? The hybrid immune versus the, uh, the people who only had been vaccinated. And you, we set up, again, relatively simple ELISAs. Uh, on the one side, we looked at IgG in these saliva samples. And on the other side, we looked for secretory IgA. And you can easily do that by having a monoclonal ant or a secondary antibody that targets the uh, second, uh, this, uh, secretory component, right? and then you only detect secreted IgA. And what we found there was when we looked at IgG, um, of course, the people who had, uh, had been infected and then got vaccinated have a really good response there, uh, but you also see a nice response in people who only got vaccinated. And that's in contrast to what we see for secretory IgA, where we have um, secretory IgA even before vaccination in the, in the upper respiratory tract, and you would expect that because they got infected, but then when you vaccinate, you get a boost. And that was somewhat unexpected because typically an injected vac uh, vaccine is not supposed to do that. And we're still trying to figure out how that happened. There are now papers that say that uh, there's some spike protein after vaccination circulating. It might end up there, but it's not completely clear. But this is in sharp contrast to what we see here with the vaccinated only, where we had a blip of two people, but basically everybody else stayed low uh, and there wasn't really a good response. And just to kind of look where these responses come from, uh, we correlated serum IgG with uh, saliva IgG, and there's a very nice correlation, again, suggesting that the saliva IgG is coming from serum, but we don't see a good correlation with serum IgG and saliva secretory IgA, again, suggesting that that's made locally. Um, and so in the end of, of uh, 2021, we started to uh, get into booster vaccinations, right? Uh, people got their first booster shots and we wanted to now look at what are the kinetics there. Um, this is actually one subject in the, in the study where you see this typical response of, uh, this person was, was uh, naive uh, before vaccination, where you see this typical response. You vaccinate, the titers shoot up, the titers wane, the titers stabilize. And then uh, the, the third dose was given and the titers shoot up again. And the question was, what would happen after that? Would it fall down to the same level again as here or would this stay up? And so uh, what I'm showing you here is what happened after the booster doses. The left graph is exactly the same one as I showed you before. The right graph is now what happens after booster dose, which is uh, at day zero. And before the booster dose, you see that these two groups still separate. The orange ones are higher, the blue ones are lower. And then when the booster shot is given, they both shoot up and it's almost like an equalizer, at, at, at least when you look at uh, serum IgG. And the other point that stands out here is that the waning was actually slower and that's important too. So something changed there. Um, and then uh, we have two people in, 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 in my lab and in, in Viviana Simon's lab that, uh, that do modeling and don't ask me what the mathematics 
behind that is because I won't be able to tell you. Um, but I always had a problem with this notion that immunity disappears, that there's waning immunity. Um, and so we asked them to model these responses based on the, on the data points that we had. And when you do that, and this is by the way, um, uh, not, the, not zero on the y-axis here, this is still a good titer. Um, you see that uh, if you, both in the hybrid immune and the naive uh, people who get their first two shots, you see this waning phase in the beginning, but then it seems to stabilize. At least it's biphasic, right? This, this phase might also have uh, um, uh, a decay, but it's very, very slow. And then if you look at boosted individuals, uh, there's less waning and then a stabilization at a the, at the much higher level. Um, and then of course, the next question was now with the bivalent boosters, how would that look like? Um, and this is something that we, we just put together. Um, so we looked at um, antibody levels after, uh, before the bivalent booster and after the bivalent booster. We now did basically not stratify into hybrid immune versus non-hybrid immune. Um, we just wanted to know what would happen and if the other question was if there would be uh, specific antibodies now against the new variant, against BA5. Um, and so we looked initially at binding and neutralizing antibody titers, and this is shown here. Uh, blue is wild type, uh, red is BA5, which both were in the vaccine. And so we see that um, you know, the binding titers um, after vaccination go up uh, in both cases. They may be a little bit lower for BA5, but again, this includes people who might have had breakthrough infections before. Um, and then in terms of neutralization, we see the same in both cases, the new titers go up. And when we look at the avidity, that goes up to, uh, on this side, you have to take that with a grain of salt because the uh, BA5 RBD is a little bit less stable as a protein by itself. And so when we do this avidity assays with a keotropic reagent, that, that uh, binding might, might be more problematic anyway. But we wanted to answer the question if there are in zero um, specific antibodies to BA5 now, if the vaccine is able to do that. And so what we did was we uh, coupled the wild type receptor binding domain to beads, and then we depleted the serum of any antibody that binds to the wild type RBD. And this is shown here, right? So you have the solid lines are undepleted serum, pre-vaccination, post-vaccination. And then here, uh, this, uh, these dotted lines are uh, post-depletion serum. And we can actually get all the antibodies that bind to wild type RBD out of that serum. When we do the same, and now we run the ELISA with BA5 RBD, we basically see the same. So hypothetically, if there would be uh, antibodies that only bind to BA5 RBD, but not wild type RBD, you shouldn't be able to deplete all of that, but that was possible. And that means that the b uh, bivalent vaccine induces antibodies that target BA5, but those are cross-reactive antibodies. They're not specific to BA5. And this goes uh, along very well with findings that Ali Alibadi recently had, uh, where he found very low frequency of memory B cells that were specific to an Omicron vaccine, but most of the B cells were actually cross-reactive. Um, the question is what would happen if you would go in with the same vaccine again, and then you might actually see more of the specific response. All right, um, and this brings me to a, another, another topic uh, and that is um, what we learned in terms of the monoclonal antibody response to the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. And this uh, was done early in the pandemic, uh, again with Viviana Simon, but also with Ali Alibadi from Washington University. Um, and so when we got our first people vaccinated in the cohort, uh, we took our first six naive individuals and we wanted to take a deeper dive into their immune responses uh, to vaccination and compare that to uh, convalescent individuals. And this is shown here in terms of serology. Uh, here on the left, you have spike binding titers of people who had the SARS-CoV-2 infection. We stratified them into low, intermediate, and high responders. And then we compared that uh, to titers that people who got the vaccine uh, developed. And what you can see in most cases, uh, the vaccine actually induces higher titers as compared to an infection. Um, the same is true for RBD binding antibodies, uh, where we also see higher uh, titers in vaccinated individuals and most of the vaccinated individuals compared to convalescent individuals. The interesting thing, and we still need to follow up on this, is that the kinetics of the RBD antibodies seem to be a little bit different compared to the full spike uh, kinetics. 
Um, we also looked at neutralization and compared, and here uh, it seems that the, the vaccinated individuals also make high neutralizing antibody titers, but they were not that much higher anymore than the, the high group for the convalescent individuals. And when we saw that, we started to, to look at ratios between um, binding and neutralizing antibodies. And this is shown here. And it turned out that even in the convalescent individuals, people who had lower binding antibody titers had a better ratio in terms of binding to neutralizing antibodies. Uh, so lower is, means hi a higher ratio of neutralizing antibodies here. If you go up higher, that ratio becomes less ideal. Um, and if you look at the vaccinated individuals who have really high binding antibody titers, they have uh, basically the worst ratios. That is not something bad per se, because they still have sky high mute titers that protects them, uh, but these ratios change over time. And I'll get back to that when we talk about the, the monoclonals that we generated. Um, we also wanted to look at back boosting. Uh, so there's four coronaviruses that infect humans, and that includes two alpha coronaviruses and two beta coronaviruses. They cause common colds, right? And specifically, the beta coronaviruses are related to, to SARS-CoV-2, uh, and there might be some cross-reactivity. And we wanted to see if you get vaccinated and you already have antibodies to the seasonal coronas, would those antibodies get boosted? And we didn't see any of that for 229E or NL63, which are the alpha coronavirus spikes, but we, see, we saw some increases against the beta coronavirus spikes of OC43 and HKU1. So it seems that there's also some interaction with pre-existing immunity in humans. Um, I think Shane saw a lot of that with T cells, but we see that on the, on the B cell side, side as well. And I'll, I'll go into, the, into a little bit more detail in a few minutes. And so, again, we worked with Ali al to uh, sort plasma blasts, um, which can be done without a bias, right? These plasma blasts, you can sort them phenotypically, and they are typically, 90% uh, of them often are, are antigen-specific, so you don't have to use a bait. And that means you can just sort and then see what they target, and that gives you an unbiased uh, picture of, of, of what type, uh, what component of the vaccine they target. And so we did that together with Ali, and we generated monoclonal antibodies from uh, three of these individuals. Um, and all of the antibodies, well, th there were a lot of spike uh, reactive antibodies in there, which is shown here. They bind to different levels, but we also wanted to see which part of the spike they bind. And it turned out that it's, it's about a third, a third, a third in terms of targeting, targeting the receptor binding domain the N-terminal domain of the spike and the S2 of the spike, and the S2 is the more conserved part. It was highly variable from individual to individual, but you saw that, that the uh, response was relatively uh, heterogeneous. Um, and of course, when you have these antibodies, the next question is, are they functional, right? And so we ran them in a neutralization assay. And to our surprise, but that goes hand in hand with the serology, um, very few of these antibodies actually neutralized. So for subject three, we only had one neutralizer and that was an RBD binding antibody. For subject five, we also had one neutralizer, which was actually the most potent one and that targeted the NTT. And then subject six was lucky. Here we had five neutralizers, uh, four of them targeting the NTT and one targeting the RBD. Um, and we also wanted to look at this back boosting effect, that this cross reactivity, right? So we also ran all of these antibodies against the spikes of uh, the seasonal coronaviruses. And sure enough, we found five antibodies that bound to the OC43 spike to different levels. Um, and three of them actually bound to the HKU1 spike. Uh, and those had uh, relatively matured CDR3s. So the hypothesis really is that they were initially, these B cells were initially uh, induced by seasonal coronavirus infections and then reactivated um, when people got this vaccine. Um, but the other question was, you see all these antibodies and very few of them neutralize, right? What do the other ones do? Are they beneficial? Are they detrimental? Is it just trash antibodies? Um, which I actually don't think there's any trash antibodies, but you know, the question is what do they do? And so um, in order to look at that, we used the mouse model that we had established with uh, one of our Farix mouse adapted SARS-CoV-2 viruses, where you actually uh, just um, transfer uh, antibody IP into the mice, and then you challenge them with a lethal dose of that mouse adapted virus, and then you monitor the mice and look if they lose weight. 
uh, and if they survive the challenge. And that's exactly what we did here. Um, and so we, I, I stratified the antibodies here by RBD antibodies in A, anti-D antibodies in B, uh, S2 antibodies in C, and then we had uh, two antibodies that didn't bind to the subunits but bound to the spike, and they're called a non-diverable here. And neutralizing antibodies are shown in red, and you see that typically, you know, when you challenge the mice, they lose weight, but if they get neutralizing antibodies, the, the mice are protected from weight loss to a certain degree. And that was something that was expected. But if you look at the black lines, um, those are non-neutralizing antibodies, and uh, these non-neutralizing antibodies, uh, actually, at least some of them, uh, protect the mice from, uh, from disease uh, relatively well too. Um, and interestingly, this one, uh, for no, actually, sorry, this one was cross-reactive to OC43, so it bound different uh, coronavirus spikes. So now why, why, why I'm interested in that? The reason was Omicron. Um, so when Omicron appeared in the Thanksgiving week of, uh, of 2021, um, we saw, if you looked at the sequence, you, you realized right away that most of the neutralizing antibody epitopes were changed, right? The expectation was that neutralizing antibody titers would suffer a lot and most people wouldn't have good neutralizing activity against this variant anymore. And this is exactly what you see here. Uh, these are convalescent individuals. Uh, here is neutralizing activity against the wild type virus, here against Omicron. Uh, most of them fall below the limit of detection, right? Um, double vaccinated people, there was a huge drop in, in neutralizing activity, 30% um, lost all detectable neutralizing activity. And the same was even true for triple vaccinated individuals and hybrid immune individuals, although there was residual neutralization, but there was a, a steep drop in neutralizing activity, about 20 to 25 fold. But the interesting part was that this was not true for binding antibody. Um, so this is basically the same set of people um, but now you're looking at drop in, in just binding antibody to the RBD, NTT, or to the overall spike. And you do see a drop here from wild type uh, to uh, Omicron, but the drop is about 2 to 2.5 fold, so much less, right? Um, and what we also saw during Omicron was um, that there were breakthrough infections, but a lot of people had, uh, had uh, protection from progression to severe disease. And the idea is that this was mostly mediated by D cells, which also kept uh, the cross uh, were also able to cross react to the Omicron variant. But we think that actually some of the non neutralizing binding antibodies are involved in, in, uh, in that protection as well, most likely through FC, FCR interactions. But because we saw this cross reactivity to Omicron, uh, we also wanted to ask is there any cross reactivity beyond? SARS-CoV-2, right? Um, this is a phylogenetic tree of uh, spike, uh, spikes from different coronaviruses. Uh, it's biased towards beta coronaviruses. Here we have um, SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2, Omi the Omicron variant is closely related, of course. Here you have SARS-CoV-1 and different uh, other Sarbeco viruses, right? Uh, then we also, in, in the beta coronaviruses, have the Hebeco viruses, Nobeco viruses, Merbeco viruses, which includes MERS coronavirus, and then Mbeco virus, where our seasonal uh, beta coronaviruses sit. Um, and then outside of that, you of course have the alpha coronaviruses and the gamma and delta coronaviruses, which are actually not known to infect humans. And so we wanted to know what's the cross reactivity against all of these. And so we just made the spike proteins and uh, ran the, the assays. Again, just simple binding assays to see how much reactivity you now have uh, against, uh, against these uh, different spikes. And we started out with pre-pandemic serum to look what the baseline was, right? And the baseline is actually very clean. So what you see here on the x-axis are the different spike proteins, right? Here we have the Sabecos, Merbecos, Mbecos, Hebecos, Nobecos, then Alpha, uh, uh, Gamma, and Delta, coronavir uh, Delta and Gamma coronaviruses. And what you see here is that you have reactivity to uh, HKU1 spike, which pre-pandemic, which makes sense because people get that as seasonal infection. Uh, you have reactivity to, um, to OC43, which also makes sense because uh, uh, people, you know, that's circulating in humans. 
And then you have reactivity to the bovine coronavirus spike, which is interesting because that's related to OC43. And supposedly uh, OC43, um, at least that's a hypothesis, uh, caused the uh, 1889, 1890 uh, Russian flu pandemic. Um, in um, well, it's more than 100 years ago, but um, when it split off from, from the bovine corona coronavirus. So it makes sense that they're antigenically related. And then we see reactivity to 229E and NL63 spikes, which are also circulating, right? But we were surprised to see what happens after SARS-CoV-2 infections, right? Uh, the idea was you would certainly see an increase in reactivity to SARS-CoV-2 spike and to some degree to the variants, but you then start to see cross-reactivity across all the beta coronavirus spikes. With some exceptions, Neocov, for example, which is a new Merbeco virus that uh, seems to bind to ACE2, uh, we don't see that reactivity there. Um, even to, um, to gamma and, uh, and uh, delta and gamma coronaviruses, we start to see some reactivity, only in about 50% of individuals, but we see that reactivity. And then when people uh, get uh, mRNA vaccines, that reactivity goes up even higher. Uh, I put uh, the hybrid immunes and the, the non-hybrid immunes together here, but you can clearly see this elevation in terms of the Sabeco viruses, right? Um, reactivity to, for example, this Bulgarian Sabeco virus spike is as high as for, uh, for, for the Omicron variant. Uh, it drops a little bit against other beta coronaviruses, um, and then again, we see this uh, reactivity to HKU15 and HKU22, which are uh, Delta and Gamma coronaviruses. And this is from a, from a um, um, conservation perspective, most likely against the fusion peptide of these spikes. And so we don't know what that means yet, and we don't know the functionality of this, although there is indications that at least against the Sabeco viruses, there is now also some neutralizing activity. Uh, but this could mean that the human population is in a way much better prepared for the next coronavirus pandemic in terms of, not in terms of infections, but likely in terms of, of pro uh, protection from severe disease. All right, um, another uh, story that I wanted to share with you is um, the antibody response to uh, the actual vaccine formulations, right? Um, so as you know, um, the mRNA vaccines don't contain any, any antigen, right? It's, it's basically, um, consists of RNA that codes for the antigen, lipids, which make these lipid nanoparticles, um, and then small molecules, salts, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there's no antigen, right? And very early in the pandemic, our question was, do we get any immune responses or antibody responses, we didn't look at T-cells, against these formulations? And so we picked uh, 10 people who got the Pfizer vaccine and 10 people who got the uh, Moderna vaccine, and we looked at their antibody responses to spike, just to make sure that they're normal responders. And that's what you see here. They're, uh, they're normal responders. There's an induction of, uh, in, uh, of antibodies after the first shot, boosted after the second shot, and that's true for Pfizer and also for Moderna. And then uh, the next step was to actually code plates with the vaccine formulations. Uh, we didn't know if that would work, but we wanted to try it. And that was actually vaccines from the, from the uh, leftover vials uh, that were used, right? There's usually residual material that's getting thrown out and you can basically use that. And what we saw is the Pfizer vaccine didn't induce any uh, responses against the Pfizer formulation, but the Moderna formulation did induce responses against uh, itself, right? Um, actually, if you tested the Pfizer uh, vaccinated <coughs> individuals against Moderna, you didn't see anything, but the Moderna vaccinated individuals responded to the Pfizer vaccine formulation. Um, and that was interesting. And then we started to look into the formulation and uh, basically the only thing we could come up with that it could be monogenic in there um, is polyethylene glycol. So these LMPs contain uh, uh, bacillated lipids and polyethylene glycol is known to be immunogenic in some, uh, in, in, in certain contexts. And so uh, initially we didn't have a good way to do that. We just ran into Peter Belize's lab and he has a huge collection of chemicals that are probably <laughs> from the 70s or 60s, but he had some polyethylene glycol and we put that on plates. I didn't know if that would work, um, but what we see is that the Pfizer vaccinees don't respond to that. Um, but the Moderna vaccine is have an increased response to polyethylene glycol over time. That's of course a dirty experiment, that's not good, 
Um, so we repeated that experiment and we used regulated bovine serum albumin. So now you have a protein carrier that you can nicely coat on, on ELISA blades and we basically see the same picture. We see no increase or very little in terms of, of uh, Pfizer vaccinated individuals, but we see a sharp increase uh, when people got the Moderna vaccine. And I don't have the slide here, but we also did a control with bovine serum albumin on its own and there was no increase. So I can't tell you what that means. We have no clue. We looked at correlation with reactogeni reactogenicity, side effects, there was not really anything. Um, this was reproduced by a group in Australia and a group in Italy, they see that too. Um, so we're not really worried about safety in that context, but it could also mean that um, if you have elevated polyethylene glycol antibodies and you get treated with uh, regulated drugs in the future, that maybe th those drugs have a higher clearance rate. And so this is probably something that should be monitored. Um, and for the last five minutes, um, I wanted to change topic again and go a little bit into what we're doing in terms of vaccine development. And this is work that I'm doing together with Vena Sun, who is uh, a young uh, PI in the department, uh, Adolfo Garcia Sastre and Peter Balesi. And so this all started um, in a very sketchy way uh, at the playground in Central Park um, in the dark in, in um, yeah, basically winter of, of uh, 2020, uh, 2020, I think it, we met in, in February or something like that. Peter Balesi was at home because he was not supposed to go to the lab because of his age, but he had an idea he wanted to develop a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine that could be produced using existing infrastructure for making flu vaccines. At that point in time, we didn't know if any of the vaccine candidates would work and if they could be scaled, right? Nobody knew if you can make millions and millions doses, doses of mRNA vaccines or if the mRNA vaccines would work. So the idea was, let's use existing infrastructure and make uh, COVID vaccines in flu production plants. And so we met and then Peter was like, ah, let's use Newcastle disease virus for that. And Newcastle disease virus is uh, an avian paramyxovirus that's a big problem in, in poultry can kill um, chickens very quickly and it's totally apathogenic for humans in, in most cases if you're not immunocompromised. Um, but because it's a problem in chickens, there's a vaccine and that's called Lasota. There's actually several vaccine strains and those vaccine strains are harmless for poultry as well. But because there are avian viruses, you can grow them into very high titers in embryonated chickens eggs. And that's actually where flu vaccines are made. And we happen to have a reverse genetic system for this Lasota strain. And so what we did was we made a recombinant version of the Lasota strain that expressed um, a modified version of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 um, in addition to its own glycoproteins. And this was a modified version. We used uh, Jason McLellan's uh, Hexapro, which is super stable and stays in the pre-fusion uh, confirmation. Uh, this also lacks the polybasic cleavage site. And we fused, uh, we basically uh, removed the C-terminus, we kicked out the transmembrane domain and cytoplasmic tail uh, of, SARS of the SARS-CoV-2 spike and replaced it with uh, the cytoplasmic tail and transmembrane domain of the F protein of NDV. What that does is you end up with an NDV particle that now has a lot of spike on the surface and also is able to express spike when it enters a mammalian cell. Now this virus can't really replicate well in mammalian cells. It can't counteract our innate immune responses. And so it's hyper attenuated, right? So it's getting shut down after, we usually say after 1.5 replication cycle. Um, it's really, uh, at least that specifically that strain is really safe for humans. It has been tested as ontolytic where people have been given IV, uh, NDV at really high 10 to the ninth, 10 to the 10th uh, BFU doses and it hasn't caused any issues. Um, so we made these constructs and um, when you run wild type Newcastle disease virus preparations on an SDS page, you see all kinds of proteins here, the HN protein, for example, N and so on and so forth. And when we run this construct, with which we termed NDV hexapro S, uh, you can see as in comparison to wild type NDV, there's an additional band and that's the full length spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. So these are preparations of, of virus particles. And so you see it's really present in the virus particle. And as I said, because this grows very well in X, you can just put it into X and then you can make vaccine. 
uh, similar to the flu vaccine uh, and you can you know you have two types of flu vaccine one is a live uh, vaccine flu <coughs> mist which is also grown in eggs and then can be given live intranasally or you can purify it inactivate it and then give it uh, similar to the regular flu shot um, and so we tried both routes um, initially we did a lot of, of preclinical development I'm not going to go through all of that because uh, that's all published um, I just wanted to walk you through one of the key experiments, and this is for the intranasal version of the vaccine. Um, here we used hamsters, and they got uh, either intranasal uh, NDV hexapro S or an intranasal wild type NDV control or uh, BVS as a mock control, or we didn't do anything to them at all. They, we just had a fourth group that was healthy control hamsters. And when you vaccinate them, uh, you see serum IgG and serum neutralizing uh, activity coming up in this first group here. And when you challenge these animals, and hamsters are relatively, um, relatively sensitive to challenge, um, you see that the controls lose weight. Um, and our healthy control, which is the dashed line here, is very similar to uh, the NDV hexapro S. So there was no weight loss at all. Um, and when we started to look at uh, virus replication in different organs of these animals, we saw that um, when they were vaccinated, there was no replication in the lower respiratory tract, um, but there was basically also not uh, a lot of replication in the upper respiratory tract. So there's this one outlier here, but in most cases there was uh, also no virus in the nasal washes. I, have, I don't have that here, but we also did now transmission experiments with the vaccinated animals and there's absolutely no transmission. So at least in the hamster model, you can use that to stop transmission. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about the clinical development, uh, we partnered with uh, GPO in Thailand, IVAC in Vietnam, and Instituto Putantan in Brazil, which are all uh, vaccine producers in low and middle income countries. And those three made inactivated version of, of the vaccine. Um, in Thailand, we're now in phase three. This is completely involved, and the idea is that there will be a readout uh, in summer, um, and Brazil and Vietnam a little bit behind. And then in Mexico with Avimex and also at Mount Sinai, we tested, uh, we tested live versions of the vaccine. In Mexico, partially as injected vaccines. They're now done with, uh, with enrollment for phase three for that too. Uh, but also as intranasal vaccines, and we have one trial at Mount Sinai that we are wrapping up right now in a phase two, uh, phase one trial where we give the vaccine intranasally as a booster dose as well. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go through all the, the details here, but this is some data from a secondary analysis from Thailand uh, where individuals received uh, either one microgram doses, three micrograms or 10 microgram doses of the vaccine and then in two cases also with an adjuvant, with ODN 1018. And then we compared their neutra the neutralizing response in that trial to people who had in New York, so that's a, a comparison that is a little bit biased, but in New York in our Paris cohort had gotten uh, the Pfizer mRNA vaccine or who were convalescent. And what we saw was that there was not really a big difference between the groups. So we see good neutralizing activity induced by these vaccines. Um, and in Vietnam, uh, the phase two that was run there was actually run with an active control, which was in their case AstraZeneca. Um, and what they saw, and this was all done by an independent CRO, um, was that um, the, they call it Covivac in Vietnam, uh, that the vaccine actually uh, was superior to what you see in, the, in, in terms of neutralizing antibodies with, with AstraZeneca. Um, so we're hopeful that uh, some of these candidates in some of the countries will get uh, licensed this year. And just to conclude, um, initially we saw that humans induce robust and long-lasting antibody responses to SARS-CoV-2 infection, even if the infection was mild. Um, we think that the neutralizing antibody response to SARS-CoV-2 is relatively complex, and it's not just against the RBT. Um, we think we know too little we know too little about mucosal immunity. Um, this is becoming now a topic for SARS-CoV-2, um, but this is also very important for other respiratory viruses. Um, we see these non-neutralizing antibodies coming up, and at least in animal models, we see that they can be beneficial. Um, that's unclear for humans uh, so far. Um, we also see antibodies against the mRNA vaccine formulations against polyethylene glycol, and we don't know if that has consequences, but I think it needs to be monitored. And then, of course, we think that uh, our vaccine candidate could uh, be really a game changer as intranasal vaccine. 
but it's also nice that uh, vaccine producers in low and middle income countries have that platform and can actually vac make vaccine in, in their countries. And uh, for those countries, it was actually given out uh, uh, on the uh, humanitarian license so they can basically do with these vaccines whatever they want. And it was really nice to see how countries like Thailand actually took that and, and developed it and moved it into a clinical trial. Um, and this brings me to my acknowledgements. Um, of course, uh, all of this work was done by, by a huge uh, team and a lot of collaborators, but specifically Viviana Simon is my partner in crime for SARS-CoV-2 studies at Sinai. Um, and then for uh, the vaccine studies, um, as I said, we have, uh, this is a collaboration between Peter Belize's lab Adolfo Garcia Sastre's lab and my lab, um, and uh, we are working together with, uh, with these uh, producers in low and middle income countries to get these vaccines licensed. And if there's still time, I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so it's not completely clear. So we know that the dose of mRNA is higher for Moderna, right? It's 100 micrograms, at least in the ini initial vaccine, compared to 30 for Pfizer. Um, the composition of the LMPs is different. So it's not clear and it's not published how these ratios of uh, regulated lipids compare. Um, so it could be the dose but it could also be a different ratio in regulated lipids, and the lipids are different, and that might make a difference too. So I'm not 100% sure, but I would like to know too. Um, I'm not so sure there's there are that many shortcomings. I think they are overhyped. They are one, uh, uh, one vaccine platform that's out there that's very useful in certain situations. Um, yeah, I don't, I, my, in my opinion, one of the shortcomings might be the reactogenicity that's associated with them. And another shortcoming is that it's relatively hard to formulate them for intranasal vaccination, right? You would just use the regular Moderna vaccine and give 50 microliters of, de of that to a mouse intranasally, the mouse dies, right? Um, so I think those are the two things that, that I think need to be optimized for future use. But in general, I think just because the, and, and that, that's maybe also a misconception when we, when we talk about COVID-19 vaccines in the United States or in, in Europe, right? The truth is that many more doses of, of vectored vaccines and inactivated vaccines were used worldwide in the, in, in the initial rollout phase in the initial year, right? So I think the important point is mRNA vaccines are super useful, um, but there's other vaccine platforms that are as useful and in some situations might actually be better. Yeah. The cold chain is another issue for the, some of the mRNA vaccine companies in terms of worldwide availability. A absolutely. I mean, yeah. I think there are now uh, data that's, that suggests that you have better stability at four degrees Celsius. And I think the, um, the CureVac vaccine, which failed in clinical trials, but that might have other reasons, um, that was long-term stored at four degrees Celsius too. So I think there are technical solutions for that, but in the beginning, that was a, a big issue. And I mean, just to the point that there might not be a, a, a silver bullet, if you look at Moderna's data with flu vaccines, right? The hope was that mRNA vaccines for flu would be great, right? And they're working, but they're just comparable to regular flu vaccines, right? Except that they have higher reactogenicity. So we saw it also after infection, but it's a very good question, right? For the pre-pandemic um, serum samples, the caveat is that they were just taken before the pandemic, right? 
we don't know when these people had their last OC43 infection or the last NO63 infection. And if you would take those zero four months uh, or four weeks after infections, uh, you might see more cross reactivity. So there might be a time factor to, we don't have enough of those serum samples, so we could do that. So that's a, a, an important caveat. Um, so it could be a timing uh, question, but it could also be uh, basically just this interaction between the, the different, uh, different coronaviruses that you get more cross reactivity. But yeah, that's something we need to, we need to look into for that. It's a very good point. Thank you.